songs, and we hope that it, it helps get everybody in the spirit and also at the same time uh, remind us of all of what I did. Uh, because I'm working really hard and I'm really proud of them. And you guys are going to sing really loud, well, right? Do your best.
you very much for all of your work and getting the kids to practice, bringing them here again yesterday, and it's a lot, it's a labor of love to coordinate this, so thank you very much. Can we give Nick a round of applause for helping to organize them? And as they step down, we'll invite the congregation to arise. We're going to have a time of congregational singing now before we open to the word together, so please feel free to stand up now. Some of you are being good listeners. Yeah, go ahead and feel free to stand up now. As our praise team is going to get set up, I just want to make one announcement. Uh, Next Sunday, we're having on Christmas Eve our service at 10 a.m. as normally scheduled. Uh, And then the next Sunday, New Year's Eve as well, we're having service here at 10 a.m. So we invite you both in the next two Sundays over the holiday season, if you're able to be with us, to join us at this time uh, for our regularly scheduled service. Right after Christmas, as a congregation, we're hosting something called the Snow Valley Rally, and that's a retreat for high school students and college students, and it comes out of the same partnership that uh, creates Midwest Camp, which is a full family camp in the summer that we do. In the winter, there's a shortened retreat for uh, less people, but this year we're expecting over 60 guests who are going to come from out of town to be here at Lakeside for three days. And so we need people who are willing over uh, December 27th to the 30th to be a host home. And if you're a host home, what that means is you're providing a bed at night and a breakfast in the morning. Lunch and dinner and all other activities are here at the church or they're around town. So if you're someone who's able from December 27th to the 30th to potentially host uh, some high school students or college students in your home, please see Brad Horner and he will gladly give you more information. But I'll pray and then we'll sing. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of song that we've just heard and all the kids preparing and remembering uh, their lines to sing to us about the good news of Christmas, that as the angels sing, that they also joined in that singing and praising you for what you did in sending your son onto this earth for each and every one of us. And so we do pray that this would be a Merry Christmas for all of us. Uh, Wherever we are in our situation in life, whatever difficulties or tragedies have come, that we would recognize that Christmas is what gives us hope for every situation. And so we pray that you would help us now as we all lift up our eyes and sing to you that as you see our heart's expression, that you would be pleased in our worship this morning. In your name we pray, amen. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare your our living hope, your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free. And my shame is undone In your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory god is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence lord There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. In your presence, Lord. And I've tasted and seen 
of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord your presence Lord let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness let us become more aware of your presence let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Holy Spirit, you Good morning and welcome. Our scripture this morning comes from chap uh, Mark chapter 1 verse 15. Jesus said the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Please continue to worship with us this morning. Oh, come thou wisdom from 
path of knowledge show and cause us in our ways to go rejoice rejoice Emmanuel shall come to
and thank you for being with us this morning. I, I think it's a common experience that in this time of the year, more than in others, we are distracted by the busyness of it. We're distracted into the activities, but sometimes we're distracted from the point of it, from the reality that we are celebrating that God has come to earth. Because of our need, he has come to redeem us. And so as we uh, experienced with the kids and the songs that they sang, they can serve as a reminder to us. They can serve as uh, something that points us in the right direction. And we pray that uh, that will be happening to all of our hearts this morning as we focus on the prophecies of Isaiah. So will you turn to the Lord with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the children. We're thankful for the reminder that they are of your investment in the future of this earth. And we're thankful that you have not just put them here to fend for themselves, but you have promised also that they and we as the parents and grandparents of them are under your care and that you have a plan and a purpose for each one of us and for each one of them. We are thankful for the joy that they display as they sing about your birth and we pray that we will be ready and able to comprehend the message that we're about to hear, that it will not be just old or routine and it will not be something we've heard a hundred times and we, we put ourselves and our minds on autopilot as we sit under the teaching of your word, but we ask that you would, you would touch our hearts and, and remind us and move us and change us by the message of your redemption, of your coming to earth to take us back to be with you. Lord, we, we pray for Peter as he will bring us the word and we ask that you will affect us by it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And just one more announcement that I'd like to share. On December 31st, the last Sunday of the year, we're also excited to have a baptism. Uh, Gabby Kowalczyk, Nick and Rosita's oldest daughter, will share a testimony that Sunday and be baptized on the last Sunday of the year. And we're excited for that and looking forward to it. And if baptism is something that uh, has not been a part of your Christian journey yet, um, you maybe have attended church, you would say you've believed in the gospel, but you have questions about what it means to publicly profess that in the form of baptism, we'd love to talk to you about that as well. And now I invite you to take a Bible to open it to the book of Isaiah in chapter 9. It's right about in the middle of your Bible. If you're using one of the Bibles provided for you there in the pew, it's on page 573. And we're going to read the first seven verses of Isaiah chapter 9. These verses come to us hundreds of years before the birth of Christ and before what we celebrate now at Christmas. They give us a sense of expectation of what it was all about. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. But there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, and Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil for the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder. The rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of his peace there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this and that's where we'll conclude our reading this morning and for us in particular this morning we're focusing on verse 6 
in just the very beginning of it where it says, for to us a child is born and to us a son is given. That first phrase, to us a child is born, we've sought as a congregation to understand what this originally would have meant in the time of Isaiah. What was going on in his day that kind of gave birth to these prophecies that he would speak? And it was in Isaiah's day that in chapter 6, he received a call into ministry to be a prophet for the people. And that happened to him right after a king had passed away. King Uzziah had died, and in that death, it says that Isaiah gathered into the temple for worship, and in that experience, experienced something that day that he'd never experienced before in all of his times uh, visiting and being in the temple, and part of it was a vision of God and then a call into the prophetic ministry. But we said for the people of Israel, hearing that a leader had passed away, even for us today, if we heard any former president had died, it would would dominate the news coverage for a prolonged period of time as people would recount all of the accomplishments of a former leader. But in particular, in that day and age, uh, someone usually ruled until they died. And so the death of a ruler also had not just the sorrow of losing someone, but then the question and the wondering of what would happen next. And Uzziah was a king who actually had a great start and a bad ending. He got puffed up in his pride, started to begin to have a a sense of self-righteousness in in his own accomplishments, and so started to do things that he knew God forbid him to do. And actually, at the end of his life, he contracted leprosy. And he wasn't able to rule effectively towards the end like he was in the beginning. But still, the news of him passing would have been something that the whole nation at the time would have been in mourning for. And so one of his sons assumed the throne. But there happened to just be a cycle in the nation as it divided from one into two kingdoms. And then as kings ruled, it it was a repeated story of as people got into power, then they misused that power and they abused it and then they lost it and someone else came in and a a repeated cycle in Israel's history unfortunately took place. For the northern kingdom in Israel, they were judged sooner and they were punished. They were conquered by a foreign nation, but even to whom Isaiah is speaking, the people of Judah, part of what he's doing is warning them that they too have to stay faithful to God or what they're seeing happening to their brothers and sisters in the north might very well happen to them. So when Isaiah says to us, a son, a child is born, he's not referring to any of Uzziah's sons. He's referring to something different. We need a son to be born who will break the cycle that we're right now experiencing. We need a different type of a child to be born. And what he was told in chapter 7 was to name that son Emmanuel. And then it's repeated in chapter 8 before we get to what we read in 9, which means God with us. We don't just need another person who will make all the same mistakes that every other person has found a way to make. What we need to know is that God is with us. That there is someone who can have power and never abuse it never manipulate other people with it but would actually have a sense of conviction that with their power that they're supposed to serve other people with it and they're supposed to do for others what they can't do for themselves and so even in his own day as he's making this prophecy no one is confused and thinking oh maybe this is one of Uzziah's sons or maybe this is one of the next kings no no no. this is a longing that they have for the repeated cycle of fallen leaders who get puffed up in pride and begin to abuse their power, that that cycle would be broken. And so he's prophesying for something that he himself doesn't know the full fulfillment of, but the name gives us a picture of what the longing is, which is that God would be with us. And so then later, in our what we read in chapter 9, as he describes it, a son who could be referred to as Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And so now we as Christians who look back on the birth of Jesus and then back on this prophecy of Isaiah say that to us a child is born is the good news that Christ has come down from heaven. The child that we celebrate 
is a completely different child. It's not just another birth that, yes, we always celebrate any life that comes into this world as a unique gift of God made in his image, completely irreplaceable. But what we're celebrating when we sing to us a child is born is the conviction that Christ has come from heaven to earth and that this child is God in the flesh. And there's profound implications for it. I'll read you this quote from a from Timothy Keller. He says, If God became truly human, then matter matters. The incarnation means God assumed a physical body and entered the material world. Many philosophies see the material world either as an illusion, like the Eastern religions, or as polluted and intrinsically evil, like the Greeks, or as the product of random chance doomed to extinction, like modern secularists. But the incarnation means that God believes the material world to be a good thing. And the resurrection shows us that he intends to redeem the physical world as well as the spiritual. This means that fighting disease, injustice, and hunger is on God's agenda along with saving souls and forgiving sins. This also means that the material world is a good thing and it's God's will for us to enjoy it profound implications in our faith that Christ has come down to us. That the God who in Isaiah, when he got that call in chapter 6, he saw him and he heard the angel saying, holy, holy, holy. One of the people most influential in our generation of unpacking the holiness of God passed away this week in R.C. Sproul. And one of the books that most people comment on that he's written that's made a difference in their life is called The Holiness of God. And when he unpacks Isaiah chapter 6, part of what he describes is just when we read an ancient text and we're trying to figure out a point of emphasis, you know, there's no emojis in the text, there's no underlining, you know, what do they really want to emphasize? Well, often it's in repeated words. And so when Isaiah saw this vision of God, and what is described of him is repeated three times, that it's the only time in Scripture where an attribute of God is repeated three times to the superlative, when the angels say, holy, holy, holy. The Bible says God is love. It never says love, 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 is how R.C. reflected on it. It says he's merciful, but it never says mercy, mercy, mercy. There's only one attribute that is repeated to the third degree, and it is holy, holy, holy. And we have a limitation in all human language to actually define that. It includes purity, that he is different, that he is other, that he is uncreated, that he needs nothing, that he is sovereign. And what we celebrate at Christmas is that all of that amazing holiness is in no way corrupted by him being born, by him taking on a human flesh and having a body and having a mom and a dad, in being a carpenter, in walking around in this earth and sleeping and having meals and fasting and praying. None of the goodness of God, none of that awesome holiness was in any way tainted or corrupted by him being born. And so that tells us then that birth, life, physicality, the material world, none of that in and of itself is corrupt or wrong. And when we celebrate that to us a child is born, we celebrate that Christ came down from heaven. The next phrase, to us a son is given. The question for us is given to what? You see, it'd be a bit superficial if we th said, you know, at Christmas time we often exchange gifts to each other and what we need to realize is the best gift is Jesus and he's the gift given to us. Have you opened up that gift or not? I mean, that's not bad. It still moves us off of complete selfishness to otherness, but that's not how the gospel story impacts, that he's just something been given 
for you or I to open as if Jesus is like a genie in the bottle and wow, we got the best present of all. We got the present that gives us all the presents because what he was given to was something profound and it required a sacrifice so that later in Isaiah 53, when again he's prophesying of the future, he says of the one who would come that we despised him and rejected him and we all esteemed him not. So at the very same time that he announces that he's given to us, he announces that the one given to us is the one who will be rejected by us, despised, not looked upon. My boys are old enough that when they see like multiple presents, they already know which ones they're looking for. So uh, this last birthday, and it's usually a combination of things. There's a toy and clothes and something. But as soon as my three-year-old saw that it was clothes, I mean, he just cracked it open. Yep, clothes. Boom. Move on. <laughs> doesn't care what's on it. Doesn't care how it fits. Just where's the one I want? Isaiah 53 says all of us have done that to the child that was born. That he was given, but we were like, what? That? I didn't want that. Thanks. But I don't need that. I need something else. So when in the New Testament it says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It's the same truth. He's been given to us. But given how? Given for what? And what Isaiah goes on to describe is that he was given as a sacrifice for our sins. He was given to the cross. He was given to be rejected. Well, why was that the case? Because that's what you and I needed for us to be able to receive him and enjoy him in the way that the Father desired. And when we understand that what he was given for was a sacrifice, it makes the meaning so much deeper, so much more profound. It's not a genie in a bottle who does whatever we want. It's a loving Heavenly Father who will do whatever is needed for your redemption and mine. And if it means being rejected, despised, not esteemed, thrown off to the side, put up on a cross, buried in a tomb, that's what he was given for. Well, then why do we celebrate that? because he did all of that in love for us. And when we say to us a son is given, we understand that Christ rose up from the grave. See, it's not just that he came to earth, like in a sci-fi kind of a story. He visited us for a couple of weeks and then he went off to another planet. No, no, no. In him coming to earth, he experienced life on this earth but then he also experienced what all of us who are inhabitants of earth experience, which is that we eventually, at some point in time, go into the earth. That's life on this planet. It happens to us in different ways for different reasons in different times, but it is the universal experience of humanity that we don't simply live on this earth, but at some point we will live in this earth. And he came not just to be on it, but to go in it. He went into a grave, is why he came. This is how J.I. Packer describes it in Knowing God. He says, The crucial significance of the cradle at Bethlehem lies in its place in the sequence of steps down that led the Son of God to the cross of Calvary. We do not understand it till we see it in this context. Here is stated not the fact of the incarnation only, but also its meaning. The taking of humanity by the Son is set before us in a way which shows us how we should ever view it, not simply as a marvel of nature, but rather as a wonder of grace. We should see the incarnation not simply as a marvel of nature, but as a wonder of grace of grace. Here's another description. This is C.S. Lewis. In the Christian story, 
God descends to reascend. He comes down from the heights of absolute being into time and space, down into humanity, down to the very roots and seedbed of nature he has created. But he goes down to come up again and bring the whole ruined world up with him. One has a picture of a strong man stooping lower and lower to get himself underneath some great complicated burden. He must stoop in order to lift. He must almost disappear under the load before he incredibly straightens his back and marches off with the whole mass swaying on his shoulders. What an amazing picture that the Christ who came to this earth and then into the earth almost like he disappeared so that when he came back, he had the whole world on his shoulders. And isn't that what the ascended Christ said when he bid his disciples farewell? Now, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. The one who was given for us has now been given all authority. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that to us a child has been born. That where we have seen ourselves as men and women fall time and again, where all of our impurities are exposed and sometimes exposed to the worst when we accumulate power and we long for someone to come, we thank you that we can celebrate that you in all of your goodness in all of your holiness were in no way corrupted by being among us. We thank you that we can call you Emmanuel. And we thank you that you were given for us. And we pray that you would help us as your children to live now in the reality that all authority has been given to you. Help us to appreciate more the depths of your love, the depths of your goodness, and make every other ordinary thing we do this Christmas season have with it an infused joy knowing how loved we are and secure we are in you. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we sing our closing song.
Isaiah heard them cry, holy, 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 he then said the whole earth was filled with his glory. And at the birth of the Christ, the angels and the hosts were praising, saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is well pleased. This will conclude our service this morning.